Before I start, there's something I remembered which I probably should have said at the very beginning of this session, uh, of this whole um, workshop. You know, the method of Vedanta consists in Shravana, Manana, Nididhyasana, hearing, reflecting, and meditating. So about hearing, um, one Tibetan Buddhist teacher, they have the same methodology, by the way. In the Tibetan texts, you find what is the procedure for uh, study and uh, practice of Tibetan Buddhism. They say hearing, reasoning, and meditating. So it's exactly the same procedure. So about hearing, how do you hear? Uh, how do you study and he especially hear uh, Vedanta talks or spiritual talks? So they have this saying, don't listen like an upside down pot, um, a leaky pot and dirty pot. I think that's self-explanatory, but it's interesting. Upside down pot is, if an upside down pot and you pour water into it, it'll just flow up the sides. Nothing will accumulate in. So sometimes people listen and at the end of it, there's nothing left and nothing was, was taken in. Swami Ranganathanji used to tell this humorous story that when he was the head of the Vedanta Center, that is the Ramakrishna Mission Ashram in New Delhi, he would give regular Vedanta talks. So there's this lady who would come and attend and sit in the front row and attend all the thing, uh, talks very sincerely. One day when the Swami was seeing of people and this lady happened to pass in front of him, he asked, um, so did you like it? And the lady said with great enthusiasm, ha, bahut achha, Swamiji, yes, but wonderful Swamiji. Uh, what did you like? Probably he shouldn't have asked that. The answer he got was devastating. What did you like? And the lady said, Wo kya pata badi badi Vedant ki baat? I don't know. With all these a lot of big talks were there, Vedantic talks. I don't know <laughs> why, why ask me. So that's the upside down part. Uh, nothing is accumulating. Don't listen like that. Don't listen like a leaky part where things do accumulate, but after some time it's lost. Uh, so that happens because of lack of holding on, lack of retention. And the third one is a dirty pot. So whatever you put in the milk or uh, you know, water or what, it gets polluted by the dirt in the pot. So a dirty pot would be like listening with a skeptical mind uh, or that I already know and I'm going to find fault with this uh, or with prejudices. So one should not, I thought I'd share that with you. One should not listen like an upside down pot, not like a leaky pot, not like a dirty pot. But probably I should have said that at the very beginning. Another thing that I should have said at the beginning is what I'm going to talk about today. We'll end this um, workshop with this. So you're talking about methods of strengthening the mind in um, non-dualist uh, non practice, uh, Vedantic methods. So, every Vedanta text that we study uh, begins with, I'll just keep track of the time. Okay. Every Vedanta text begins with a set of practices or preliminary qualifications. They are called sadhan chatushtai, the fourfold qualifications for practice or fourfold practices, preliminary practices. Um, why am I saying this at the end? Because we ultimately find in the study and practice of Vedanta that this is what really, um, this is the real obstacle. This is where the shoe pinches, so to say. Um, one Vedanta teacher told me, a very well-known Vedanta teacher in the south of India told me that these are the four uh, condition, the four practices, weakness in which uh, prevents realization, enlightenment. Uh, he said, 
with these qualifications, with these practices, if one studies Vedanta, it will lead straight to enlightenment. Without these in sufficient measure, if we study Vedanta, we'll end up the, with a feeling that we have learned a particularly clever philosophy, but that's just it. Swami Vivekananda himself says, he, in, in his complete works, you'll find a note he wrote to an American devotee, a very interesting note, and just two to three pages where he talks about the four yogas, Jnana Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, Raja Yoga, and Karma Yoga, and he summarizes them in his inimitable way, full of insight, in just two to three pages. And about Jnana Yoga, the path of non-dual Vedanta, he says, many people come to an understanding by this path, few realize. So he said, that, uh, here realization depends on control of the senses, which is one of the central practices we are going to talk about. So here goes. The first thing they talk about is called Viveka, from the where the name Vivekananda comes. Viveka, in Sanskrit, the word means to separate, to discern, to analyze, to, to uh, take a thing apart and see separately. Something is coming mixed up with you to see them separately. Um, Vivich Prithak Karani, that's the Sanskrit grammatical derivation. Uh, the root is to root mean root meaning is to separate to see separately As to see separately means here the discernment is between the eternal and the non-eternal we have read about heard about an eternal reality a spiritual reality that is the most worthwhile thing that we can we, we know about so to keep that clearly in mind that such an such a reality is available to us um, eternal reality beyond sorrow which which promises complete lasting deep fulfillment such a thing is available before us and everything else is non-eternal by non-eternal is meant transient it is changing subject to change subject to destruction subject to coming and going even the best of things that this world has has to offer will one day go will one day die will one day perish so this difference should be kept clearly in mind the second thing is vairagya. Vairagya is dispassion. Dispassion means that which I see to be worldly, um, secondary, transient, non-eternal, I should have a dispassion for it. In the sense that uh, a monk gives up all of it, family, money, worldly pursuits, and has a one-pointed pursuit of enlightenment. So it's not possible for everybody to become a monk. You know, this is one of the big, big questions in Vedanta. Is it meant only for monks? Should one become a monk to, a Vedanta, to be a Vedantin? You can, but it's not possible for everybody. What is, however, necessary and possible for every seeker is to become monk-like. Uh, may not be uh, you know, formally a monk or a nun, but a monk-like person internally, that the goal should be God realization or enlightenment is my only goal in life. I am a spiritual person. I seek enlightenment and that's it. That does not mean for a person in the world, do you give up your job? Do you give up your family? Not necessarily. Uh, but all of that becomes secondary or um, you know, at the periphery. Externally, one may continue to do what one is doing, but then that also has to be spiritualized. Um, so, for example, when Arjuna asks this question to Krishna, what should he do about the battle which he's facing? Sri Krishna first teaches him about Vedanta, about the, the self, and that self has to be realized. And Arjuna is, uh, he is uh, thinking, well, this is what I want. Then I won't fight this battle. And Sri Krishna shows him how remaining where he is, doing the work which he is doing, how he can spiritualize his everyday life even something as horrible as a battle. And so everything has to be spiritualized and still in the middle of that, he can still be a perfect spiritual seeker. I like this about Mahatma Gandhi's birthday was just a few days ago, uh, where he says, who am I? Some people think I'm a politician. Others think I'm a freedom fighter fighting against the British for the freedom of India. Others think I'm a social reformer. But if you ask me, I am a simple man in search of God. Now, 
that's how a person can have full vairagya dispassion in this in the midst of tremendously of a tremendously busy and active life also it's possible so that's what i mean is in the middle of uh, of samsara one can be detached and one can pursue uh, god realization or self realization but vairagya is necessary uh, if one is pulled towards something in samsara and places that as equally important or more important than god realization if self realization is one of the many things on your list it's not going not likely to happen um, it it should be the first thing the the whole purpose of life that may sound like a tall order but actually it isn't i am telling you most of us we already had these qualities um, the very fact that you have spent uh, two days hours and hours and most of most of us here have been spiritual seekers we have been studying and practicing for many years so we are spiritual practitioners we are spiritual seekers just that own up to it that my purpose is god realization you may not advertise it you may not uh, go around uh, saying that from now on i'm a spiritual seeker and I, all of you are secondary to me no uh, but that should be the the psychic center of our being vairagya a dispassion for worldly pursuits goals uh, relationships um, possessions oh, and often being monk like and having this passion will also uh, inevitably reflect in our life life will become simpler uh, more inward those things are bound to happen over time then comes the uh, what is called the six fold treasure the six fold treasure there is basically six disciplines so there is a little bit of cheating going on here they said four practices and now in the third practice they have packed in uh, six so six have been packed into one head so you have a total of nine now so viveka vairagya and the six disciplines or six uh, treasures the six treasures the six disciplines are shama shama means serenity of mind and uh, not to get upset with what the world throws at us maybe Uh, our household situation or the job or personal health or finances or uh, the political situation around whatever it is that is that is likely to disturb you don't get disturbed by this if you cannot maintain your serenity of mind don't come into contact with it protect the serenity of your mind uh, shama but that is necessary for vedantic study and vedantic practice dama control of the senses uh, which means actually the physical senses just because i have legs does it mean i have to keep walking around going to places no um, why i'm saying that is i see this is a very busy place manhattan and they say new york is a city that never sleeps but dreams so apparently everybody is dreaming but never sleeping here uh, the, luckily the because of the covid situation one unexpected benefit is people have cooled down a little bit but otherwise um people are moving around working day and night and uh, the weekends are given to uh, partying and as they say unwinding and then again they get wound up throughout the week big days if we keep doing that uh, then um, there, there would be very little time energy and motivation left over for spiritual practice of any kind why just vedanta so dama control of the uh, external senses then uparati rati means a tremendous engrossment enjoyment of the world uh especially sense pleasures uparati is just the reverse to pull back from too much engagement with the world too much party cut that down to the minimum or to zero if possible so that there is a lot of time and energy left over and the mind is not disturbed the mind is not agitated or over excited or stimulated so uparati once we have done these we have a lot of time left energy left so the decks have been cleared for action so the fourth practice is samadhana four time in mean of the six treasures the fourth one is samadhana fourth discipline is samadhana samadhana means focus settling down meditation some of the commentaries say at this point one must have already reached excellence in yogic meditation one must be able to meditate very well already so they that it's they are saying as if this is a preliminary required for vedanta to, to be a proper vedantin one must be a good meditator already samadhana uh, and then titiksha 
titiksha is a spiritual fortitude a spiritual toughness that i shall bear trouble and suffering and yet not give up my spiritual practice my daily study and reflection and meditation i will continue to do that as much as possible doesn't matter what suffering the world throws at us see we undergo so much suffering persons in the world to hold on to a job to pursue a career to raise a family how much people put up with how much physical suffering how much patience how much consistent effort over the years um, so i think god realization is probably easier than that so one must have some kind of toughness otherwise what happens is in times of trouble the first thing that is sacrificed is spiritual practice you don't feel well so i won't get up too early in the morning i feel i have no time so i'll sacrifice my meditation or study no um, that spiritual toughness must be there titiksha and then the um, sixth one is um, this uh, shraddha shraddha is a faith in the teacher and the texts so what the teacher is saying what the texts are saying maybe i don't understand it right now but there is something really very valuable here i must keep at it taking it to be true until such time that i see for myself that it is true it not, does not mean a blind faith or belief that it just says so and you have to believe it no no not at all so you have shama dhamma uparati samadhana titiksha and then um, this shraddha so six treasures these are uh, six treasures they're all packed into the third practice sadhana chatushtaya viveka vairagya six treasures then the last one is mumukshuttvam so mumukshuttvam means an intense desire to be free an intense desire to be free um so this uh, i'm reminded of um, somebody who used to come to swami abhedanand ji's classes here and this person said one day that is this true swami and the swami said yes what you are teaching is this true yes and this person disappeared it seems never to come back again and uh, it was later found that he had retreated or she had retreated to a, a remote location and spent the rest of her days in uh, meditation so look at the immense seriousness with which this person is approaching this teaching that if this is true what else matters and if this is not true then what else matters if it is true that that uh, brahman is there and i am brahman it can be realized in this very life all my problems will be solved why not do that why do anything else so this intense desire for freedom from suffering now it it's not just in uh, uh, in the path of knowledge it's, it's also equally in the path of devotion sri ramakrishna used to call it vyakulata a divine discontent a restlessness for realizing god and he said that itself is the central precondition for realization if one has vyakulata uh, a, a, dis, a tremendous discontent a divine discontent not discontent about the world we generally are very complacent uh, about our spiritual lives but uh, disturbed about our worldly lives should be reversed be content about what what we have achieved in the world what we have got good and bad the mixture that's there and uh the discontent should be transferred into uh, why have i not realized god yet why does uh, why ca- am i not meditating more studying more trying to practice what i have understood so this is vyakulata uh, a divine discontent that's devotional language the discontent about you know why have i not been able to see god yet great mystics have realized god they have seen god why can i not i not see god and in the path of knowledge this is i said in the morning this starts as jigyasa a great inquiry that uh, the, the greatest of inquiries is this true that i am none other than the absolute and it ends with enlightenment so this whole process is mumuksha or mumukshutva intense desire to be free so now you have these practices four practices um viveka discernment between eternal and non-eternal vairagya or dispassion for the non eternal six fold practices shama dhamma um, uparati samadhana titiksha shraddha and the fourth one is 
mumukshutvam, intense desire to be free. Now, one more word about this. As that Vedanta teacher told me, these are the, this is your strength in uh, the pursuit of realization. This, this gives strength. So, we already have this in some measure. If we did not feel that there was something worthwhile, we would not have invested time and money and energy in, in pursuing, not just these two days, but most of us, uh, we have been pursuing a spiritual life for some time. So we have that viveka, that there is something uh, transcendental, worthwhile to be gained here, and uh, we feel that. Um, second, vairagya, a dispassion, a certain dispassion, See, the very fact that we are, we are all sitting together and hour after hour for two days, we are discussing these uh, high thoughts. This, everything, like everything in life, this comes at an opportunity cost. You know, if you buy something, you are, living, you are giving up something else. So in these hours, you could have done something else. You could have watched TV or, you know, or done something else, you know, entertainment. We did not do that. That shows some amount of vairagya is already there in our lives. Uh, and we have been doing this for years. A certain amount of maturity actually brings about a some amount of vairagya. As the Swami said earlier, uh, moral, ethical life, disciplined life begins to show to us that there's nothing particularly extraordinary or stimulating and, or uh, something very, very attractive about life out there. It is basically ordinary. And spiritual life is the one which is really worth having. I like that saying that uh, whatever is behind you and whatever is yet in front of you is as nothing compared to what is within you. So whatever has gone on in our lives, we are either proud of it or sometimes we have full of regrets. No, nothing to be extraordinarily proud of, nothing to really regret. Uh, bless it all, good and bad, it has made me what I am now. When we are very curious or anxious about what is in front of us, what will happen, we have all a kind of expectations, hopes and dreams and fears. No, not even that. Far more important than all of this, my past and my future, much more important is what is inside me now. That has to be discovered. It is literally nothing less than God. The most important thing in the universe, most important thing in our lives is right within ourselves, available all the time. So that has to be discovered. Compared to that, uh, our pasts and our whatever is in the future is very small. So Vairagya. Um, one more thing. Um, and of course, all the disciplines we have to some extent, even to simply sit for a few hours together, one must be little... Uh, control, in control of the body and the mind. Otherwise, you'll be restless jumping around here and there. Um, there is some faith in what we are saying, the texts which we are studying, the Shraddha is there. Even if you are not enlightened, we believe there's something very valuable here. And a certain desire is there for transcending our uh, relative, our mundane life. So all these qualities we have to some extent, but these must be pushed towards a level of excellence. Uh, they, they must become intensified. The Viveka must be kept before the mind. Swami Vivekananda says that keep these high thoughts before your mind again and again. We have hypnotized ourselves into be believing that we are small and we are petty. It's out of this smallness that all evil comes. So this process, it's not a process of hypnotization, it's a process of dehypnotization. We've already hypnotized ourselves. So keep these high ideals before oneself. Now, one insight into these practices, an important insight, this comes from one of the Shankaracharyas, one of the present day Shankaracharyas. He says, these, practice, these practices are causally linked. Causally linked. What does it mean? Each one is caused by the earlier one. Each one is caused by the earlier one. So, Vairagya, suppose I say, I have. Um, so suppose I say I have problems in concentration. So concentration is one of the six, six treasures. Now the six treasures are strengthened by Vairagya. So go back to the 
causal, the causally prior one before the six treasures is the second one, Vairagya. See, the first one, Viveka. Second one, Vairagya. Six treasures, third one. If my weakness in the six treasures, I am not disciplined. My mind is not calm. I am not concentrated. Or I don't have enough spiritual toughness. All of these, they are traced back to lack of Vairagya. Instead of trying to concentrate or trying to increase my spiritual toughness, increase the one before that. Vairagya, dispassion. If Vairagya is strong, the sixfold um, practices or treasures will become strong by themselves. I don't have dispassion. I still have some kind of attraction for the sense pleasures of the world, something like that. Then instead of fighting the battle there, it's a very difficult battle to fight there. Go back to the root, the one before that, that is Viveka, the discernment between the eternal and the non-eternal. Immerse your mind in the truth that there is this tremendous thing before me now, um, God realization, compared to which life which I've been leading, 20 years, 40 years, 60 years, 80 years, what have I got from this external life? And here is the promise of infinity. So when the mind becomes, begins to realize what is, what is possible for it, uh, then Viveka becomes strong. When Viveka becomes strong, Vairagya as a matter of course, is a matter of um, just simple um, fact is it's strengthened, it becomes uh, more intense. When Viveka and Vairagya are strong, the sixfold treasures, they become strengthened. When all of these are strong, then the intense desire to become liberated, that, uh, that arises. You see, when you say intense desire for liberation, we feel hopeless because I said, might I have a desire for liberation or enlightenment, but not particularly intense. It, I could, you know, give it a few more days. How do you increase a desire? It's um, easy to say, uh, come and eat this food. We understand. All right. But if somebody says, be hungry for this food, how? Either I am hungry or not hungry. I can eat it if you ask me to, but I can't be hungry. Uh, it just because you've asked me to. Similarly, intense desire for liberation, I can't generate that by myself. Either I feel it or I don't. The same problem with bhakti. Uh, intense desire for God, intense love of God, then it's done. Um, God realization is assured. It's just a matter of time. But how do I have intense love for God? I can't force myself to uh, love God intensely. So uh, the insight is, that the earlier ones, Viveka, Vairagya, and the six treasures, if you strengthen those, the cumulative effect is um, an intensification of the desire for freedom. So this is a very great insight, a secret. How do we actually practice these four practices? Um, they are causally linked. Wherever you find a problem, don't fight the battle there. Go back to the earlier one and strengthen that one. You will find this one becomes strengthened. All right. What else did I want to say? Um, yes, these are very important. I've mentioned earlier, I've heard it from Uttarakhand sadhus also. Um, in one, a very, very great sadhu in, in Uttarakhand, in the Himalayas, discussion of Vedanta. And he said to a young monk, your um, grasp on Vedanta is strong. You have a grasp of Vedanta. But strengthen, he said, Sadhan Chatushtai Drid Hai Mahatma Ji, are you firm in your fourfold practices? Strengthen that, realization is guaranteed for you. You have understood Vedanta, but you go back, go back to the preliminaries. They are the unglamorous foundation for Vedanta, but it, that, uh, that foundation must be strengthened. Otherwise, it does not work. Okay, I think I'll stop here. All right. Swami Aparupananda, would you like the first question? Okay, yes, just a simple question about the, the, the general topic, not about the things that you said, but if you could say a word about this also in the same, in the, in the same topic. Uh, I heard long back when I was in training center that there was a tradition in North India uh, when sadhus would see each other, pass each other or something, and instead of saying, hi, how are you doing, or something like that, <laughs> they would, uh, there was a tradition of saying, drishti sap hai. Is your insight clear? Uh, and I only heard that once, uh, though I traveled uh, for a short time among traditional sadhus in North India, in Varanasi, in Kankal, Haridwar, Rishikesh, Uttarkashi, Gangotri, other places. 
I only heard it once, but I did hear it once. But I wish I would like to hear you just comment here, comment on that idea of drishti uh, sape. Is your is your sight clear? Uh, as in the context of strengthening the mind for the practice of advaita. Correct, correct. That's a very inspiring way of greeting somebody. I have actually never heard that directly. I've heard another version of, of it. Darpan Safe, is your mirror clear? Is your mirror oh. clean? Or your oh. mirror polished? And I found uh, it in Swami Vivekananda's inspired talks. In the very beginning, he says, the only thing we can do is polish the mirror. A very cryptic saying, just a single line. Uh, the only thing we can really do is polish the mirror. So enlightenment comes by itself, it seems. The only thing we can do is polish the mirror. Yes. One questioner asks, Yogi and Gyani, they come to the same realization. You have said all paths, even Vedanta, only show a portion of the limitless reality. That the freedom gained is the core purpose. Uh, so the and the freedom of either path is uh, considered equal. Does this mean that anyone can make up their own philosophy and practice, and as long as it is self-verified, freedom was attained, then it could be considered equal to Vedanta? I don't think so. I remember this uh, interfaith. This question reminds me of an interfaith event I attended at Rutgers University. So there are people from speakers from different faiths. And the questions were interesting. One question especially has remained in my mind ever since. This young man, he said, um, I have this project of starting a religion myself. So I would like to learn from you. So he's, he's there because he wants to start his own religion. So we all wish him good luck, of course. Uh, <laughs> so I don't think one can set out to invent a religion for oneself. And why would, why would you do that? Um, the purpose is to become enlightened. The purpose is to become enlightened. Uh, so you set out on your path to become enlightened. You have a path, a devotional path, uh, a yogic path, or um, a path of, of knowledge, or a mix, or a synthesis of all of them. Swami Vivekananda, in fact, recommended a harmony of the four yogas, uh, of knowledge and devotion and meditation and work. So he said, this is the best. Uh, synthesis uh, or harmony of these four yogas. But yes, in a certain sense, the questioner is right. Swami so Vivekananda also said, said that let there be as many sects in religion as possible. Uh, each human being has his or her unique path to God realization. So even when we are part of the same religion or part of the same spiritual movement, it, for all serious practitioners, if you question them carefully, you will see each person has his, his or her own uh, unique way of understanding the tradition and the parts of the tradition which he or she likes and what he or she is putting into, into practice, what seems living to that person, what seems mechanical to that person. Uh, so we have our individuality and that should be respected. Swami Vivekananda was all for individuality. He said, think your own thoughts. In one place he, he says, I do not want that kind of religion where they're all like soldiers in a jail. Uh, all uh, standing up, nodding their heads and w turning around all at the same time to, to commands. Uh, don't be like that. Uh, be individuals and uh, make your own path. So make your own path here means learn it, your own tradition. Immerse yourself in your own tradition and practice. You, it, inevitably, you will have your uh, own uniqueness. Swami, is it okay to mix uh, Patanjali's um yoga and uh, Shankara's jnana and mindfulness for daily practices? That is one of the questions we are supposed to reflect on at the end. Uh, in fact, I can see oh. one the question which is there for me, what can Vedanta uh, practitioners utilize? Okay, the, okay <laughs> we won't, that won't be a spoiler. There is another one here. Some say focusing on God realization is selfish when there is so much suffering in the world. Please address this. I don't think so. Uh, the direct answer for that is then go ahead and combat the suffering in the world, try to relieve the suffering in the world and make it a spiritual practice. Karma yoga is basically that. Uh, I know this uh, young, not young, middle-aged monk, uh, was a doctor who passed away just a, 
month ago, Devin Maharaj in Kashi. So I was reading about his life for the last 20 years, years, he basically sacrificed his own life day and night working for the poor people there in, in Banaras. Uh, his clinic used to be flooded with patients and in the evenings and nights he would work on uh, literacy programs for, uh, for children and adults. And he spent his life like that for 20 years without rest, without proper food. And he died at the age of 60. Now imagine, for him it was a spiritual practice and a very powerful spiritual practice. And yet the entire practice was to combat, to fight against uh, the sufferings of the world. So one can do that, certainly. So I mean, do we have any examples of people who have reached the goal currently living? This seems so far off. Yes, we have. I'm not going to tell you who, but I don't, I don't know, but I think myself that I have met at least a few. I'm very conservative about enlightenment, God realization. I think I've met many who are spiritually advanced, but if you ask me, did you meet anybody who was uh, enlightened? I think I met four or five who were actually enlightened. And that's my, my just my judgment, my, my sort of understanding. So it is certainly possible. It is possible at all times and we must do it. Let me share here an interesting uh, uh, incident which happened last, last year at, at Harvard in the philosophy department. There was this formidably in a, uh, intellectual professor at Harvard who asked me, how many people attain enlightenment? Very few in each generation. Wouldn't you agree? I said, I suppose so. Then statistically speaking, it's more or less impossible for most of us to attain enlightenment. So, so why? My question is, why should you at all try? Why should you even walk on a path where success seems very minimal? That was his question to me. I gave him two answers and he himself provided me with a third answer, but a beautiful third answer. So if enlightenment is so rare and your goal is enlightenment, then this path seems to be destined for, uh, for disappointment and failure. Why walk on this path at all? So the two answers I gave, I'll tell you, and the third one which he shared is also very wonderful. Two answers I gave, why should one try to become enlightened? One is, everybody will be enlightened. In Vedanta, we know that this lifetime or the next lifetime, ultimately it is our own inner reality. What can prevent it? It cannot be prevented. What prevents it is, is our own struggles and resistance, our own foolishness. So how long are we going to struggle against enlightenment? We are going to be enlightened in this life, hopefully, if not in the next life. So that's one answer. And everybody is going to be enlightened. Sri Ramakrishna used to say in Kashi, in Benares, in the land of Mother Annapurna, everybody will be fed. Everybody gets food. Some get it in the morning, some in the afternoon, some have to wait till late evening. But everybody gets fed. So in the same way. The second answer I gave was, what else are you going to do? Once you begin to understand what is at stake here, what is the purpose of this life, spiritual life, um, even if I do not get enlightenment in this life, what else is there to do? Nothing compares with this. Nothing is meaningful in comparison with this um, search for God realization. So you have to be, once you understand what, is, what spirituality is about, one must pursue this path, whether you are a monk or a householder, whatever. So you have to pursue this path. Then he gave me a third answer, the professor. He said the two answers you gave are, um, are good, but they're kind of theoretical abstract. I'll give you a practical answer. Why should one walk on the path of enlightenment? Um, he said, because once you start walking on this path, the benefits that one gets, the peace of mind, the accumulated strength, the, the idea of a purposeful, meaningful life. And it is so clear after some time, you would not want to give it up. No matter when enlightenment will come, when moksha, nirvana will come, you will not want to give it up. Um, one young man went to Swami Shivananda, who was the president of our order in the 1920s. He had just become a monk. And he said that I've spent a few years in the monastery and nothing is happening. I was grumbling about no lack of spiritual progress. And Swami Shivananda said, go back, then go back. It was very straight away, go back to uh, wherever you came from. And this young monk was stunned. He said, no, no, I cannot do that. So, the life which you spent years and years in the world with your parents and as a student, that life is entirely unacceptable to you just after a few years in the monastery. 
which means, do you think this is any little progress? This is a tremendous progress. So yes, um, that is the, so these are the three answers. Why should one walk on the path of enlightenment, God realization? The next question involves two parts. Is it a good idea to combine different types of meditations or should we stick to what the guru instructed? And another person writing, do you need a guru to reach enlightenment? One should clearly stick to what, what the guru has instructed. If you like to do some other practice, do it as the saying goes, on your own time. Uh, <laughs> gurus, the time given to the practice given by the guru is God's time. You have dedicated it to that. So I always say, and there's a computer term for it, create a firewall around it. So there's the spiritual practices that Guru has taught, create a firewall around it. No matter what we read, the latest book we, we read, don't tamper with the practices given by the Guru. Those are sacrosanct. Whatever we read and study and the practices do we do at other times, they will go to enrich our uh, spiritual practices, no doubt. They are not separate. But the exact practice, the mantra and the technique given by the guru, that should be kept sacrosanct. Let's see. Uh, there's another question coming. I find it difficult to completely submit to the concept of God. Can I still successfully practice Vedanta and yoga? Yes. Yes. Um, though Advaita Vedanta has a component of the theistic God, but remember, the entire practice starts with oneself, an inquiry into oneself. You can start, start that straight away. And in yoga also, the entire practice of Ashtanga yoga, Ashtanga yoga, there is no reference to God. Is, um, God plays a kind of marginal role, a role of a guru and helper uh, in uh, Patanjali yoga also. Sankhya does not mention God at all, at least the kind of Sankhya that we have available now. So... There are entire phases of Indian philosophy where, where God does not enter the picture. But I would say that if, you, if one has even a little bit of faith in God, you are blessed, blessed. Take it as a working hypothesis, supposing some such power exists. So we can make a beginning. Very good. So I mean, this last uh, question is uh, more philosophical. Uh, and it may take more time than what you have, but uh, can you explain uh, the differences between Kashmir Shaivism and Tantra and Vedanta and Yoga? Can you give basic similarities oh, and differences? That's, that's huge. <laughs> that's I know huge. it's huge. Uh, I, it, Kashmir, Shaivism, you know, uh, Kashmir Shaivism itself is a, um, a enormously sophisticated, ancient, Ayan Maharaj calls it a Baroque philosophy. So very intricately worked out philosophy. And there are many, many differences. In fact, I'll show you one book very quickly. One of the recent scholars and the, one of the greatest recent scholars on Kashmir Shaivism was Dr. Jaydev Singh. So this is a publication from our Institute of Culture in Kolkata. It says, Vedanta and Advaita Shaivagama of Kashmir, a comparative study. So this is the answer to your question. On <laughs> one side, Kashmir Shaivism, and on the other side, Vedanta. And this is very concise. Uh, they have uh, like, uh, I think, 14 or 15 differences which he has uh, outlined. So a lot of differences. He has given an outline of Kashmiri Shaivism, an outline of Advaita Vedanta, and then the major differences between them. Um, there are similarities also, of course. But I will I mean, not it, attempt to even enter this, the subject. Right. Uh, we have some very basic uh, questions here, practical questions. Uh, how important is sobriety for a spiritual life? Is taking alcohol, cigarettes, or other substances compatible with wanting to meditate and progress spiritually? I think if one is... Um, one goes to the extent of being intoxicated, uh, then it, of course, difficult to do any kind of cognitive work, let alone, um, you know, meditation or Vedantic study. Uh, I suppose it's compatible with uh, social drinking or, or smoking, um, but better not. <laughs> uh, I, I remember this funny story. I don't know how true it is. 
uh, Houston Smith quotes it in his the Religions of the World, that it seems that the Tsar of Russia was uh, thinking about what kind of religion to choose for his people in Russia. When he heard that, so the choice was between Christianity and Islam. When he heard that in Islam, drinking is prohibited. So he decided, that, well, let's go in for Christianity. In the Russian, <laughs> Russians like their vodka, you know. So, <laughs> but yes, in all serious practice, um, any kind of intoxicants is, is prohibited. Um, but um, one need not be a fanatic about it. So for example, uh, at one time, you know, I've seen Uttarakhand sadhus smoking uh, even ganja. Uh, and, but if you ask them, it's not a good practice. No good sadhu would try to do that. They, it probably started as a way of keeping the body warm in, in uh, um, snow, uh, but it is addictive. So one should not do, one should not do that. 